Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are currently located. My name is Sarit Katan Gribitz. I'm an associate professor of Judaism in the theology department at Fordham University and the acting director of the Center for Jewish Studies this year. I want to welcome you virtually to our community and to thank you for joining us for today's event, a book launch celebrating Professor Nina Rowe's newly released book, The Illuminated World Chronicle, Tales from the Late Medieval City, published by Yale University Press just last week. Nina's multidisciplinary study examines a curious genre of illustrated books that gained popularity among the newly emergent middle class of late medieval cities in the Bavarian and Austrian regions from around 1330 to 1430. These books told tales from the Bible, ancient mythology, and the lives of emperors in animated vernacular verse enhanced by dynamic images. Nina will share images and texts from her book, and I, alongside all of you, am excited to learn more about them from her. Nina is joined in conversation today by Professor Effie Shoham Steiner, an expert on urban life in Europe in the late medieval period. Before I formally introduce Nina and Effie, I would like to express my thanks to Professor Magda Tedder, Siobhan Verleza, Kelsey Miles, and Christina Bruno for all of the time and care they devoted to planning and advertising this event. I want to express especially gratitude to Nina for agreeing to share ideas from her book with us and to let us celebrate with her, and to Effie for so generously joining us today to discuss the book. And of course, thanks to all of you for making time on a Sunday to learn and celebrate. For those who wish to purchase Nina's book, you may use the code YAC89 to purchase the book um, at a discount from Yale University Press. And shortly, I'll put that information into the chat so that you all have it easily accessible. Nina Rowe is professor of art history at Fordham University. Her previous books include The Jew, The Cathedral, and The Medieval City, Synagoga and Ecclesia in the 13th Century, and Manuscript Illumination in the Modern Age, Recovery and Reconstruction. Her research has been supported by fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Council of Learned Societies, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and she is currently president of the International Center of Medieval Art. On a personal note, I know Nina as a kind, modest, yet daring colleague who is generous with her time and ideas and who gives great tours at the cloisters and is a really beloved teacher. So I'm lucky to be able to work with Nina on a personal level. Professor Ephraim Shoham Steiner is professor of medieval Jewish history at the Department of Jewish History at Ben Gurion University of the Negev. I'm excited also to announce that this year, Effie is a virtual New York Public Library Fordham Research Fellow in Jewish Studies, working on a project titled The Holy Community of Cologne, New Perspectives on the Medieval Jewish Community. He is the author of the book titled On the Margins of a Minority, Leprosy, Madness, and Disability Among the Jews of Medieval Europe. And his latest book titled Jews and Crime in Medieval Europe was just published this month as well. And I hope that you'll join us next semester on February 17th for a panel discussion and celebration about it. Without further ado, I turn the floor over to Nina. Okay, thank you. Um, now, am I the main person on the screen, I think? Um, all right, so welcome. Um, thank you so much, Sarit, for that lovely introduction. I'm really, I'm honored and delighted to be here and to be able to share a bit of my new book with our audience today. Here's the book here. Um, and to have a chance to talk about my work with Effie Shoham Steiner, a scholar who I greatly admire. Uh, before we get going, I want to express my gratitude to Fordham's Center for Jewish Studies for unwavering support over the years, and especially for the enthusiasm of Magda Tetter and Sarit Katan-Gribetz 
It's always fun to work with the two of you and I feel so lucky to have you as colleagues. And I'm also grateful to Siobhan Ferletza for orchestrating the administrative side of our proceedings and the handling of the tricky tech. So, um, and finally, I wanna thank our viewers for tuning in on a Sunday. A really a silver lining of the situation under which we're all living now is that we're, you know, we're operating in a way that so many friends and family members across the country and around the globe can be part of this. So I appreciate that. So my new book here, The Illuminated World Chronicle, Tales from the Late Medieval City. I'm going to read a selection from this book, um, but first I need to explain a little bit about the material that's examined in it and my approach to it. My study addresses one kind of late medieval illuminated manuscript, and these are known as Weltchroniken or World Chronicles. These books were best sellers of sorts in the late Middle Ages, and primarily it seems among Christian audiences. And now these world chronicles aren't necessarily what many people would expect. What the, you know, the name might imply that these books are annals of the various happenings of the world year by year, or one might anticipate that they'd be accounts of battles or recount the administrative doings of kings, but the, they are none of those things. Um, what these are are books that are filled with tales, narratives from the Bible, stories from ancient Greek and Roman mythology, and legends associated with emperors from antiquity on, stretching into the 13th century, and all of these woven together into a seamless and very long telling. And the texts are told in catchy rhymed verse, as Sarit mentioned, and in Middle High German, the language of the street rather than the church. So these are key things to know about the texts in the manuscripts that I study, but also these manuscripts that concern me were enhanced with extensive image cycles, up to 250 or 300 illuminations in a single codex. And illumination, of course, is the term that is used for pictures and ornament painted into medieval books. Um, these images are remarkably playful often with unexpected iconographies. And I'm an art historian and therefore I'm interested in the pictures, in the way they enhance the text. And I'm also interested in the material, the physical fact of the manuscripts that I study. So I, I, I approach each manuscript as a sort of a coherent whole. There are 56 extant illuminated World Chronicle manuscripts and my study addresses 24 of them created between roughly the year 1330 and 1430 in the regions of Southern Germany and Austria. That corridor that runs um, from Nuremberg to Regensburg down to Salzburg and east to Vienna. Um, the other key thing to note is that these are these manuscripts were popular not with churchmen or princes, but rather with the lower nobility and the top ranks of burghers, that is city dwellers. And I examine the picture and text cycles in the manuscripts in relation to the interests of those audiences. So now I'm going to turn to um, the text. I, I, I do have a question. Um, for our tech, for maybe for Siobhan, I don't know that I'm the main person on the screen, but um, I'm just going to keep going in the hope that I am misunderstanding how the tech is going. Um, and I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to read from my book. And I just, um, the section that I'm going to read deals with Noah, Noah on his ark. Um, each one of my chapters here um, is, okay, I, I see somebody has indicated to me that I'm the mean person on their screen, so that is fine. I'm gonna stop worrying about the tech. Um, so each one of my chapters, there are seven chapters, and each one is centered around a different sort of character, where I start with Adam and his descendants, and I move to Noah and then Moses, then Paris, Hector, and Achilles. So you see there's, you know, 
ancient uh, mythology woven in there. Then I go back to Nebuchadnezzar and his idol and Daniel. Then there's a section on Alexander the Great and Nero and Charlemagne. And then uh, the final chapter deals with Im stories and images of the Holy Family that, and focused on Jesus and Mary. So I'm going to read from my second chapter, um, which deals with um, the story of Noah, as I said, it's called um, The Devil on Noah's Ark and Desire in the City. And I'm going to share my screen and show some images um, alongside uh, that, you know, that go along with the text. So to keep it interesting. So there. All right, here I go. The deluge threatens and Noah hurries his family onto the ark. Through the windows on this house-shaped boat appear a man, a woman, and various animals, the beasts paired off two by two. At a hatch in the roof, a bird flutters in, hastening to avoid the coming rain. At the center of the vignette, the aged Noah lunges through the door of the vessel. Bearded and white-haired, he implores his son to hurry aboard the boat that will spare the family and chosen animals from the wrath of God. But the youth laughs nonchalant about his father's pious obedience. The angered patriarch, eager to get going, admonishes his son, devil, get in here right away. You don't know what you're doing. Ging tufel in, du hast neither threaten sin. And that is the Middle High German text um, in the manuscript. The actual devil who looms behind the boy in the image takes the patriarch's chance name calling as justification for staying close on the heels of Noah's son and steps inside the ark himself. This episode sets in motion a dramatic and amusing account of what happened over the 40 days and 40 nights on the ark. A tale in which Noah obliges his family members to swear they will remain chaste while shipbound. In which the stowaway devil entreats Noah's son and his wife to sleep together despite their oath. And in which Noah seeks to decipher puzzling clues, those footprints you see in that picture there, and finally forgives the younger generation their sexual transgressions. In this world chronicle account of Noah's Ark, divine wrath against humanity becomes incidental to a more comical story of devilish trickery and erotic desire. The image of the entry of the devil onto the Ark, along with preceding scenes of shipbuilding and subsequent ones depicting the devil's temptation and the amorous couplings of the son and his wife, and Noah's discovery of the liaison, appear in a manuscript from Austria around the year 1380, now in the Vienna Österreichisches Nationalbibliothek Codex Series Nova 2642. While most every one of the illuminated Weltplanik manuscripts addressed in this study contains at least an image or two showing Noah and the Ark or the deluge, Nine of them include the expanded telling of the devil's hijinks and the romantic entanglements on the boat accompanied by illuminations. Frequently, these images are whimsical in their presentation of the devil's attempts to outsmart Noah and his kin, and they, are, and they often render the lovers with striking frankness at odds with theological conceptualizations of the deluge as an episode exemplifying divine wrath, spiritual cleansing, and ultimate mercy. In this chapter, I will consider the Weltchronik scenes of the devil's visit to Noah's Ark as handled in three manuscripts created over the course of several centuries. There's the Vienna manuscript already introduced, Another one from Bavaria or Austria in the last third of the 14th century, now in Wolfenbüttel. And the third one, a codex that's also now in Vienna, the Österreichische Nationalbibliothek Manis Codex uh, 2921. The texts of the Noah's Ark portions of these three manuscripts draw mainly on Jans de Enikel, 
though the Wolfenbüttel Codex has interpolations from the Christ era poet and represents a larger family of manuscripts with text attributed to Heinrich von München. And so just to explain, the textual makeup of the manus these Weltchronik manuscripts is quite complicated and it is a kind of pastiche of texts by a trio of authors. And this is explained elsewhere in my book. It's incidental for our discussion here, but it's worth understanding and it is explained, of course. In the discussion that follows, I consider the farcical world chronicle accounts of the devil on Noah's Ark in relation to late medieval lay attitudes toward marital desire and sexuality as measured by ecclesiological expectations in the late medieval urban realm. The manuscripts examined all can be localized to the Austrian region and with the core texts for the Noah passages attributed to Jans de Enikel, a patrician resident of Vienna, that city will serve as a case study for the present exploration. And here I'm just showing you a later, a 15th century printed image of Vienna, just so again, you have something to look at and to help imagine the city. The city of Vienna witnessed a remarkable expansion in the central decades of the 14th century. And by the time that the three manuscripts discussed here were created, it was a significant trade hub, an essential transfer station to points east and south, and a cultural and intellectual center that had been built up to rival the imperial capital in Prague. Unlike Salzburg, which is exam examined in the previous chapter, however, in the 14th century, Vienna was not the seat of a bishop, and the ecclesiastical institutions in the city were young foundations. Mendicants preaching about urban mores and university men who were committed to seeking practical applications for theological formulations here coexisted with newly wealthy and powerful representatives of the burgher elite. In these circumstances, the edifying force of doctrine had to be reconciled to realities of daily life with its carnal drives and temptations. The positions of clergymen convert, connected to late medieval Vienna, as well as municipal measures supporting and controlling prostitution, inform my inquiry into the expectations and realities of conjugal sexuality. In the illuminated Weltkoniken considered here, reader viewers were given the opportunity to delight in tales of forbidden sex and to look at frank pictures of the same. These accounts seem to mock or flout clerical admonitions to chastity, while they register in forthright terms an eagerness to indulge in a story centered around a romantic liaison. Though Noah is duped in these episodes, he is presented as no fool, and he too seems to recognize that there is little shame in succumbing to the charms of a lover, even if one is conveyed to the boudoir by the devil himself. Okay, that is the setup for my second chapter. And I think that now um, Effie is going to um, do a little uh, sort of setup of his own. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, before we delve into Nina's fascinating and thought provoking book, uh, I want to again thank the Center for the Study for Jewish Studies at Fordham University for convening this auspicious gathering, and especially thank Magda, Sarit, Nina, and Siobhan for their kind invitation to read and discuss this book. Uh, over the past few months, we learned to appreciate the small advantages of these very strange times uh, of a world pandemic. One course, of course, webinars existed before COVID ravaged our world, but I think we realized pretty quickly that this awkward situation of social distancing, inability to travel and lockdown, and especially our distance from libraries also presents some opportunities to get together virtually using the tools provided by modern technology, enabling us to continue some of our work and engage with colleagues and friends overseas. I must confess that reading through Nina's book, Illuminated World, uh, is a multi-sensual experience. 
first and foremost, it's a joy to behold. Although I haven't had the privilege of actually holding the book in my hand, uh, I read the PDF version on my PC screen and enjoyed it every, every page of it. Uh, the extracts Nina chose now and in the book uh, from the various manuscripts of the World Chronicles masterfully discussed in the various book chapters are exquisite. While I was aware of a few of the images and even used some of my own, some of them in my own teaching, I again confess that the lion's share of the images brought forth and so sophisticatedly discussed in this book were introduced, at least to me, in this book for the first time. And I want to share with you my screen just to give you a glance of what I'm talking about. There we go. Okay, um, so hold on for just a moment. Okay, um, so in this sense, uh, the book is literally an eye opener as it expands and multiplies the visual image reference library of a medievalist like myself, specializing in the lives of Jews in medieval Germany. Um, uh, Jews were by and large, an urban segment of European society and all the more so when we discussed the Jews that lived within the boundaries of the Holy Roman Empire during the period the book focuses on. Nina delves deep into the medieval German urban experience and while the book does not focus on Jews as such, it says a lot about them and their immediate environment. In this respect, it really corresponds with what I do. In Nina's previous book, she discussed the Jewish issue head on. Uh, the topic of her former book, the first book, was the relationship between the Jew, the cathedral, and the medieval city. Um, using an analysis of the figures of synagogue and ecclesia on the portals of medieval urban cathedrals as a point of departure, Nina showed how the image of Jews played a key role in both shaping and projecting theological ideas regarding the role of the Jew and Judaism, both in the economy of salvation as well as the imagination and parlance of 13th century folks in the rising urban centers of Western Europe. While her first book gravitated on the 13th century Reims, Bamberg and Strasbourg, this book moves forward in time and eastwards in geography from the West to the central and Eastern areas, examining a wide array of topics that correspond to the lives of medieval German burghers in the 14th and 15th century. Nina opened this afternoon event with references to the chapter about the devil in Noah's Ark and the ways the World Chronicle convey to us uh, in both text and image some of the sexual practices that were common among folks in Southern Germany and Austria's urban centers like Regensburg and Vienna. When reading through this chapter, I couldn't help being reminded of an exemplar, exemplum from Sefer Hasidim that I discuss in my book, Jews in Crime, in medieval Europe uh, that was just published last week by Wayne State University Press. One of the chapters of this book discusses crimes involving women, among them prostitution. The story I'm referring to appears in Sefer Hasidim, literally meaning the book of the pious. I will not talk here about this fascinating book compiled by the Jewish pietist, ethical master, mystic, and miracle worker, Rabbi Judah ben Shmuel the pious, who died in Regensburg in 1217. The scholarly discussion about this book is vast and began with the emergence of the Wissenschaftler Judentums movement um, almost two centuries ago. Many scholars of medieval European Jewish studies have used this book in their scholarship. And I will just mention here the work of Professor Ivan Marcus of Yale University, who has been studying Sefer Hasidim for almost half a century now and written both the groundbreaking Piety and Society the Jewish Pietists of Medieval Germany, published by Brill back in 1981, and his more recent book, Sefer Hasidim and the Ashkenazi Book in Medieval Europe, published with the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2018. The exemplum I was thinking about from Sefer Hasidim came to mind apropos Nina's discussion about sexuality, the work of mendicant preachers in Vienna and Regensburg during the 13th and 14th century, and the question about sexuality, prostitution, and chastity in these medieval spheres. In the exemplum, in Sefer Hasidim's article number 58, Rabbi Judah praises a local Christian bishop for not only regulating prostitution, 
but for restricting the presence of prostitutes in the public sphere altogether, especially during market days when many people frequent the town. And here's the text for you. Uh, and for those who don't shy away from Hebrew, you can look at the second, at the lower part of the screen where you have the Hebrew original. Go forth and learn, says Rabbi Judah, from a Gentile lord. A certain bishop had a large marketplace in his locality. Many people would assemble there on the market days, and did, as did many prostitutes. These prostitutes had a madame, a geveret, supervising them. The bishop told his servant, take a considerable sum from my purse and hire the services of all the prostitutes, for tomorrow is the market day, and they all come to the market. After you have hired them and paid the sum they require, have them assembled in one house and make a fine bed for each and every one of them. Provide them with food, drink, and with fiber for spinning to keep them busy and keep them in that house until the market is over. Only then you may let them return to their place. The servant did as he was told. He approached the, ma the madam and said, anything you desire, I will give your women even more than you would earn during the market, the day at the market. And he gave her all that she wanted in payment. He then had them all put in a, one house outside the town and he kept them there until the market was over. Only then he let them return to the town as he would do this whenever this, there was a market and the prostitutes would come. All the more so Jews should be mindful and segregate and safeguard from any violation indeed facilitating transgression is the moral punchline of this short exemplum. The exemplum demonstrates not only knowledge of the regulation of prostitution and the connection between markets and prostitution, but also knowledge of how brothels were run by a woman who oversaw the prostitutes. Furthermore, it holds up as praiseworthy a Christian political religious authority who is as concerned as pious Jews are with public mores and not, no less devoted to preventing vice. Jews, says the author of Sefer Hasidim, should emulate the bishop. In one manuscript, the text differs slightly, <clears throat> instructing the reader to learn this important lesson, not from a lord with authority among the Gentiles, sar shel goyim in Hebrew, but rather the righteous among the Gentiles, kshirim shel goyim. Later in the 13th century, in 1276, the German king Rudolf von Habsburg attempted to curb prostitution in Vienna in a similar fashion. He placed the city's prostitutes under the authority of, his exec of its executioner, tantamount to outlawing their trade altogether. Each Saturday, these women, were, these women paid the treasury a weekly tax with a base rate of at least two fenny. After paying the tax, they were required to leave the city as they were forbidden to remain in the city on Sundays for religious reasons. King Rudolf's decree also forbade prostitutes from entering Vienna during the 40 days of Lent under penalty of physical mutilation. In suggesting how to limit prostitution, Rabbi Judah's exemplum simultaneously displays his understanding of its causes and driving forces. When the bishop's steward assembles the prostitutes for, after making his offer, he provides them with food, drink, shelter, decent living quarters, payment, and yarn for spinning. Now, Rabbi Judah viewed these, all these as essentials that would enable the prostitutes to refrain from soliciting clients and plying their trade at the fair. In other words, in his mind, women became prostitutes because of financial need, hunger, thirst, and homelessness. Some prostitutes, especially with their clients in any public space that could become private for a few moments, a dark alley, a doorway, market stand, or vacant lot will do. Providing the prostitutes with shelter and a bed may have been a way to draw them into an enclosed space and prevent sexual acts from taking place in full public view. The provision of fiber responds to the medieval men's anxieties about the idleness of women. Both Jews and medieval non-Jews believed that idleness was the cause of wanton sexuality in women. Spinning fiber into yarn was considered from as early as Roman times to be an ideal occupation for a woman who was not engaged in any other household task. The Franciscan preacher Bertold of Regensburg that is featured in Nina's book mentioned um, 
in his famous vernacular sermons in German that men should fight and women should spin, expressing ideas that circulated in the urban centers of Bavaria and Austria. Provision of yarn thus not only kept the prostitutes busy, but also served as a badge of dignity that marked them in male eyes as normative women, at least for a short time. Judah the pious holds up the bishop and his steward as role models for the Jewish community. They expend money, time, and effort to reduce the level of sexual promiscuity at a time when men might most easily be led astray. While the pietistic agenda formulated and promulgated by Rabbi Judah and his disciples generally sought to keep Jewish Gentile relations to a necessary minimum, the exemplum indicates that there were apparently contacts that facilitated the exchange of ideas and other non-tangible commodities, such as moral principles and practices, which is exactly what Nina is putting forward in her book, these tales in the vernacular that basically spread ideas around town and can be picked up by many, many people, Jews included. Now, turning to Nina's book, although the text and the art of the illuminated variants of the Weltkronik discussed in the book are very seriously analyzed, both from the textual and the iconographical point of view, this is only a point of departure for a much, much broader discussion of a host of issues that are skillfully unpacked in her erudite discussion. Attitudes towards royal authority, Christian ethics, theology, heresy, skepticism towards teaching of the church, uh, the role of the Inquisition, as well as social, commercial, financial, stylistic matters uh, that featured on the horizon of medieval urban folk and German-speaking lands at the time are all masterfully discussed in the book. One of the main features of Nina's discussion in this book is the local aspect made vividly present already in the introduction, where Nina begins uh, tying the art of the World Chronicles to the local features of the sites where the manuscripts were produced, illuminated, and used. Reading through the book, I was constantly reminded of one of my favorite quotes from the aforementioned Sefer Hasidim, compiled in Regensburg. For those not familiar with Regensburg, I should say that the imperial city of Regensburg is one of the keystones in the book, and many of the arguments made in the book gravitate around the city and its particular history. Several of the illuminated manuscripts at the core of Nina's discussion were produced in there, and in her book she expands not only in the particular history of the city, but also on the fact that it had a sizable Jewish community that featured in both the text and the art of the World Chronicles that were produced in the city. And I showed you just a few examples when we began this small discussion. Unlike some other localities featured in the book, Regensburg was an old city that emerged from the mists of Roman times and reached prominence and affluence. Situated on the strategic point on the confluence of the Regen River and the Danube on an old Roman Relimus road from east to west, um, it served in the 12th century as an imperial hub and an important gateway to the Eastern provinces of the empire, like Austria, Bohemia, and beyond into Poland and Rus. Long distance traders from North and South, bankers and financiers, 1170 to the famous Steinerne Brücke, the stone bridge on the Danube visible even today after having been spared the fate of many medieval monuments in Germany that were damaged during the turmoil, turmoil of World War II, Regensburg became increasingly important for the traffic heading south to Venice and from the Apennine Peninsula into the empire. As Nina demonstrated, the city of Regensburg was, was a contested territory between the local inhabitants represented in what was called the Rat, the local assembly, the emperor and his court, and the nearby magnates, the Dukes of Bavaria. Jews settled in Regensburg relatively early. Regensburg, or Ratisbon, as it is called in Latin, had a recorded communal presence, Jewish communal presence, from as early as 981, um, possibly even earlier, judging by the location of the Jewish neighborhood at the center of the uh, old Roman walled perimeter. And here we have uh, a snapshot of the archaeology of what probably what was found in Regensburg regarding this uh, Roman perimeter. And you can see that the Jewish 
uh, area of habitation, the Yudaorum Habitacula, uh, that is mentioned in uh, several uh, um, documents from the 10th and 11th century, is situated right on the Cardo Maximus of the previous Roman uh, uh, compound. In this seminal study in the early of the early text documenting the existence of a region within the city, while uh, walls populated by Jews, again referred to as the Yudaorum Habitacula, from the first quarter of the 11th century. This is the site Nina relates to as the Judenstadt, located in the center of the city surrounding the modern Neufahrplatz. Uh, with the main artery, Residenzstrasse, previously Judengasse, running right through it. And here you have, uh, this is a tourist map of, of modern Regensburg, and this is a snapshot of the uh, Neufahrplatz, the church that actually came instead of the Jewish synagogue that was uh, raised to the ground in 1519 when Jews were expelled from Regensburg. of the Jewish quarter uh, drawn in or, or colored in black in the middle, right next to um, the main artery running through the town. So we're talking about a very visible Jewish presence in the city and very important Jewish presence. And when I come to think about Regensburg, I came to be reminded of this um, reference Yuda Hasid makes to how Jews and Christians relate to one another within a medieval city. And he's probably thinking of Regensburg when he's saying this. Um, Be advised, says Yuda Hasid, if Jews eventually dwell in that town, their sons and daughters will follow the behavioral patterns of the local non-Jews. For in every city and town, the manner of behavior of non-Jews is similar to the Jews living amongst them in most localities. So he's making a very, very general and broad statement about how Jews and Christians interact on a con you know, a, a, a cognizant level and probably also in the back of their minds, um, mimicking one another, exchanging ideas, exchanging uh, thoughts, exchanging tales, uh, exchanging Morris. And I think this is what I would like to ask you and kind of ask you to maybe elaborate more on. Um, you so masterfully discussed uh, the figure of Moses, for instance, with regard to Regensburg in the book. And if you can talk a bit more about how the Jews are featured in the Christians' minds as much as the Christians are featured in the Jewish mind. Okay, terrific. Wait, why don't you stop sharing now? Okay. now unless, right. yeah. Right. Okay. okay, good. And good. then maybe do, I think we both- And I mute come on oh okay and then i stay on yeah i can't hear you okay well um all right so about how um the sort of the jews and christians uh, engaged with one another in the city of regensburg is i mean it's something that comes up in in like or that, that i relate um in the way the velconique tell the story of um Moses, because what's really remarkable about the presentation of the story of Moses in the Velkoniken is this extensive um, narrative that's given about that emphasizes his Jewishness. That is like where um, the like once he sort of set off in the basket down the road uh, or down the river rather, and is discovered and then brought into the Pharaoh's um, court immediately there is an emphasis like pharaoh says i don't want him if he's jewish and then they go on and on talk there's this just a long discussion about is the child jewish is he not is he? and then finally somebody says well if he's circumcised we know he's jewish so there's a big focus on that um then there are um and what i found also striking in the texts is that before little Moses gets discovered um, by the, um, it's actually the wife of the Pharaoh in the telling in the Vilconica, not the daughter. Um, there is an extremely sensitive um, discussion of the sorrow of Moses's mother as she runs down the banks of the river, tearing her hair out screaming and wailing as her baby runs away. And it goes on for, um, 
you know, I don't have the exact figure, but many, many lines of um, in the account. And, um, and then that focus, and so that kind of sensitivity I think um, is noteworthy uh, that it you know suggests that you know one can empathize with the suffering of a Jewish mother separated from her child. Then there is that that long discourse on is the child um, Jewish at, when he first arrives at the court. Then there's uh, there's uh, another sort of very sensitive presentation of Moses as a Jewish child that is that as you've pointed out to me also Effie, like that one sees in um, all kinds of folk tales, both from Christian and Jewish origin about mm -hmm. little Moses knocking the crown of the Pharaoh off and then the test with the sort of the fiery coals, which we can talk about. Mm -hmm. But then finally in the Velkonikin, there's also a really um, kind of amusing section that um, you also had an image from where once Moses comes to be um, like, you know, a teenager or an adolescent, his maid says to him, you know, you're not like everyone else at the court. Look at your, your, your penis and you'll see how different you are. And he looks at him down and there's an image of him looking at himself. Um, illustrated and he says, oh my gosh, I'm a Jewish child. So the, he, um, so the point is, or what I see is that given the sort of the dynamics, the sort of the day-to-day -day engagement in the street in Regensburg with the Jewish quarter so close in to the, all the other centers, the sort of the mercantile and administrative centers of town, it's clear that people were, it seems, sharing stories and also may well have been curious about one another's rituals. There would be a mikvah in that space as well. Mm -hmm. And you could imagine also the audience for these Velkonik manuscripts. I mean, these are the kinds of things that were read as entertainment in the evening and sort of, you know, reading over them together, the touching parts being something that bring people together, the amusing parts with Moses sort of realizing his identity. Um, also, you know, being a kind of collective experience, but also one that, I think so, the registers in some way, at least the possibility of people being curious about those outside their circles, but who engage intimately in the sort of the network of the city. Um, I, I agree fully. I think one of, one of the amazing aspects of, especially that chapter on Moses is how it, it struck me to what, the level of intimacy that is going on. And this is something that I've been, I'm, I'm thinking about for, for a while now of how basically we've been, you know, uh, art history and medieval art, art history and medieval studies has been discussing uh, Jews from their kind of vantage point. And, and Jewish studies have been discussing um, Jews and the history of Jews in the urban, sphere, in urban centers of, of, of Europe for a while, and it, it's time to work more in, in, in unison and, and see how, first of all, these texts talk to one another, correspond with one another. I mean, the, the exam, the just two examples I brought forward um, uh, are, are, are only tidbits from things that, I, that came to my mind while I was reading the book. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you just two more that, that kind of really struck me. In, in the chapter that you discuss uh, Nebuchadnezzar's idol and uh, the um, issue of the possibilities of uh, critique against the church uh, within urban circles, especially in the 13th, late 13th and early 14th century. And Regensburg also registers there very prominently. Um, one of the things that struck me wa were things that are um, related to the Valdensian heresy, so to speak. And of course, um, we all remember that part of what the Valdensians were advocating was against worshiping icons and worshiping uh, um, statues and the veneration of statues of saints and Christ and Mary. Um, that is one thing. And that, of course, registers on, on, in your discussion in that chapter. Another thing is their very strong kind of rejection of the use of oaths. And that was to me an eye opener because 
exactly the same circle that I mentioned before, the Jewish pietists of medieval Germany who migrate from the Rhineland and eventually wind up in Regensburg, they're concerned with the same exact issues as the Valdensians are, and they move in along the same line geographically and make the exact same move from west, from the western provinces of the empire into the east. They trickle into the east. The other thing that I found amazing was that the Valdensians mentioned in your chapter have a network of people that they know. Part of what you were, what you show in this chapter is how during the Inquisition, people are asked to name the Valdensian acquaintances they have in each and every town so that the church can kind of uncover these clandestine networks of Valdensians that people would travel from one hub to another extending their uh, hospitality to their kin, to their kin or brethren in the same beliefs. And this struck me as very, very similar to the way Jews perform on exactly the same level. Jews had similar networks within not only the empire, but beyond the boundaries of the empire, where they, where they felt safe to be part of their kin and working in the same kind of network formation. So in, in my mind, this was really an eye opener to think about larger structures where medievalists and people from Jewish studies can share more uh, regarding the issues that are at the heart of what we do. That's great. Actually, what you brought up, that are, there are so many things I want to pick up on, and I want to try and do this in a coherent way. I mean, one thing that you say is, yes, as far as like the scholarship in Jewish studies, it is in that that I found so much inspiration, not just for thinking about Jewish Chris or like, you know, Jewish experience or even Jewish Christian dynamics, but also thinking about what happens in cities in larger terms. Indeed, I mean, one of the challenges as an art historian, of course, is that what, what tends to survive from the 13th and 14th and 15th centuries and what is exhibited in museums, of course, are fragments of um, mo primarily Christian devotional works. And so, I mean, I'm just gonna share my screen now just because I have a few images that, you know, make this more um, sort of pertinent, zippy, oops, sorry, um, for what we're talking about. But, so this is a shot, for instance, this is, you know, the Cloister's early Gothic gallery and the, the, the Germanisches National Museum in Nuremberg and details of, of work in Paris and in Bonn for, you know, a very sweet image of the Virgin and Child and a very agonizing image of the Pieta. Um, so these are all late medieval fragments that survive and this is what, or, or that are exhibited. Um, and so this is what sort of shapes um, conceptions of the Middle Ages. And of course, these um, works are important uh, remains of some facets of medieval society. But of course, there are things that go on when people are not thinking about God. And as an art historian, however, primarily our evidence resides in works like this or things made for the tippy top nobility. That is, those were the things that were prized and protected over the years of destruction. And when then discovering the illuminated Weltkoniken, it felt to me kind of like a treasure trove of materials of both sort of texts where you have the actual voices in the you know middle high german you know dialects and so you could actually imagine actual voices spoken in the streets and then the images themselves um also you know capture things and and give some sort of texture or fill out an image um that otherwise isn't recorded even in um sort of in in documents you can you can get at things such as sort of um, let's see, like for this instance, this image of this person being bounced on a cowhide. This is um, in a detail that, you know, comes along in my chapter where I deal with Nebuchadnezzar and his idol, and this is a punishment. And so uh, as you see an image like this, this isn't part of the standard iconography of medieval art, but it actually, as you 
dig deeper, you there is enough evidence for us to discern that this is a kind of um, this could be either the kind of sort of playful jesting that students and other members of confraternities did with one another, but there were also actual punishments where people did this kind of thing to one another. And so the, the visual evidence of illuminated Weltkolni can sort of invite us to ask questions and then thereby to also try and amplify the voices of you know, that can tell us more about day to day experience where skepticism can become part in, for instance, of the story of the Middle Ages. These are examples from my chapter that deals with Valdensian heretics, that is, that um, Effie mentioned. Um, and there is an image of Nebuchadnezzar's idol being venerated, and the idol itself is in the form of a you know, higher late medieval architectural element, the sort of floriate finial or crocket. And what are the, I'm showing also now shots from Regensburg Cathedral that are covered in these elements. And so this seems to be a kind of critique of the built environment of the um, high medieval city and the, even the sort of the Christian practices. Um, but you're never going to find a text um, that where an average person in the street who's, you know, right at thinking in middle high German is, talks about um, that kind of critique. We do, however, have evidence for, of, of people who were condemned as heretics who did critique the luxury of the church. And that's where I'm coordinating evidence from um, sort of trials of heretics to these um, world chronicles, again, in an effort to try and connect the dots to see how these images in relation to the you know, larger books that they're a part of can tell us about, again, the texture of a world that is separate from like the highest, highest courts or the sort of the realm of the church in the Middle Ages. And I think that that's important work um, because again, sort of casting the Middle Ages as this sort of other place where everyone was pious in some way um, is, I mean, really distorts history, and there are um, there are a variety of reasons that you know that we want to, of course, you know, sort of look at history and ourselves more straight on. Um, okay, so I'll stop sharing now. Um, I see there are some questions. Should we mm -hmm. be getting to those? Um, That's a good idea. Okay. Do you want to go, Effie, or? There's, I, I could take this one about the quality of the artistry and the technical skills. Um, and this brings me, sorry, back to my um, images. Oops. Um, one thing that um, you know, comes to the fore in this slide comparison is the fact that these um, works represent a sort of a range in medium. Um, and that is exciting to me, actually. After the year 1380, when um, paper starts to be made in southern Germany, the majority of the illuminated world chronicles that were created were made on paper. And so what I'm showing you here in this slide on the left is an example from Bavaria, probably Regensburg or around there, um, where it's made in paper um, with washes. And then um, here's another one also probably from Regensburg um, that is on parchment with the more traditional medium of um, tempera paint. Um, and in this slide, I also try and show the, uh, the, the range in scale that you see, because some of these are relatively small and could fit on a lap a little bit. And others are, some of them are, you know, actually huge and have to be, can only be carried by two people. They're so big. Um, and the one that I'm showing here from the Getty um, is sort of in between. It can be pretty comfortably picked up by one person, but it actually, it, you, you, you actually, you, you pretty much want two people um, with this book. But the point is, um, you know, back to the question about technique, is we see a great deal of playfulness, particularly in the manuscripts that are created um, using the new medium of paper 
with washes and you have a kind of looseness where often the figures themselves are not confined to framed vignettes like you see in the more traditional layout of the mise en page of the work on the right but rather they kind of bound around and sometimes look like they're going to come you know flying off the page they don't have frames and they often sort of um, scurry around in the margins um, so that person who asked the um, the that question um, did I I hope I addressed that enough Nina, may I jump in um, and ask you a few questions that came in as well as you were speaking? Um, first of all, thank you to both of you um, for a really interesting conversation so far. Um, there was a, a question about medieval concepts of historical veracity and how they might function in these texts. Do the authors claim that all the events they recount occurred in real life? Do they present some episodes as more legitimate and others as apocryphal? Do the image cycles play a role in anchoring stories in contemporary discourses of historicity? Um, so those questions about um, the relationship between history and narrative in these texts. That is a great question. And um, it, I don't, there is no, there is no the sort of simple straightforward of like, yes, a claim at the beginning say, and it all happens, so it's true. Many of these do begin with a, the story of the fall of the rebel angels. Like there is a sort of a general Christological framework for them. Um, and so there, but I think what is important to, to recognize is that, that sort of the distinction between the legendary and the real or the biblical and the ancient mythological, and then what we would consider the historical, that, I mean, is entirely effaced. That is, it does not pertain. There is no sense when reading these that one is like reading along about the stories of, say, you know, I don't know, Adam and Noah and, and then um, and and Moses, and then you switch to the stories of the Trojan War, and of course the Trojan War is understood as historical, but all that it opens with the judgment of Paris, and so we have you know Venus and Athena and and Juno there vying, and it's all just part of a story, and then you go back and you have the story of Charlemagne. Um, for instance, or you have Alexander the Great and Alexander the Great doing things that we would consider to be legendary, like going down under the water in a diving bell or flying up into the sky in a flying machine with, with griffins carrying him up. So I don't, I think that the, like our expectation that there would be a claim about sort of something being authoritatively historical does not pertain here. They seem clearly to be created in a way um, that was made to be entertaining. But there is, um, and so they get into the legendary. But one can say, of course, when you depart from um, or departure from uh, what you know, what could be verified as truth doesn't mean that it's any less real. In some ways, like they're more humorous and more sort of down with experience and more real in that way than any sort of account of a battle would be so um, that's great so we have another question specific um, or two two other questions specific to the manuscripts the first is a question uh, about um, how specific are these books to the german context and did similar books circulate in other areas of europe um, and then um, similarly a question about the narrators are their names known? Um, how, how are the books presented? Those are also great questions. On the subject of um, the, the circulation of these, they do tend, they seem to be like the heyday of this kind of, and this, these, this sort of cluster of texts as they show up in manuscripts is really this century between about 1330 and 1430 in the Southern German uh, Austrian region. Um, there are things that are similar in that you get versified vernacular Dutch Bibles, for instance, but they leave out a lot of the sort of the fun, saucy, legendary stuff or the weaving in of, again, tales that we would consider to be, you know, uh, 
um, uh, from the Trojan War. Of course, you have the Grand, Grand Chronique tradition in France, and that is associated, I mean, the sort of the most celebrated ones, or the Bible Historiale in France, um, the most uh, celebrated ones are circulated around the French courts, but there are some also lower rank ones. But again, those two, the, those chronicle histories um, leave out, again, the sort of the fun narrative parts. They're much more dry. So the answer is these are a Southern German phenomenon. These are kind of their own thing. Um, on the subject of the narrators, um, yes, I mean, as I mentioned, there was a little snippet in the bit that I read that, that sort of names various. There are three principal um, authors associated with these texts. And um, so Rudolf von Ems, the Chris Terra poet, and Janste Annika, for those who are, know anything about this. Um, but they, and so they wrote in the 13th century, between about 1250 and 1300 or so. And, um, and scholars have done amazing work, again, creating, you know, again, editions of their text, trying to piece together a sort of a, a, a pure version of the text of each one of those guys. But what's interesting is these illuminated versions from the 14th century again, pick and choose sections from those three authors and paste them together, um, more or less, into manuscripts where the, the illuminations are kind of like pictorial spackle. I mean, they kind of like, like um, uh, sort of bind together the various texts. And so there is no distinction. Indeed, in some of these, they will vary from not just um, passage to passage, but even by line, they'll be lifting from one or the other of those original um, authors. So again, it's a kind of 19th century or modernist drive to distill the particular um, uh, authorial voices of those three um, original 13th century authors. But by the 14th century, I think that the people who bought Illuminated World Chronicles did not care who those three um, original authors were. They were just World Chronicles. Um, thank you so much. Hi. The next set of questions is about um, Jews in the text and who might have been reading the text. So on the one hand, um, can you tell us a little bit more beyond the examples that you already shared about how Jews appear in the manuscripts and also your choice methodologically to weave um, um, discussion of Jews in the manuscripts um, into your own book? And the second question is about the nature of the relationships between Jews and Christians in these urban contexts. Um, and the idea that medieval books circulated among reading communities, that even when they were um, made for a particular patron, um, is it possible that they move, the books themselves moved between Jewish and Christian communities or Jewish and Christian artists, um, and how that might have worked, um, and, and um, what our evidence for that is, and what that tells us about the books and their communities. Okay, those are great questions. And I'm going to start with the second one, just because there is actually a there's a really intriguing example of one of these um, that's in Heidelberg. Um, but again, and it was it was uh, this one was again, made made in this again, the same region, it wasn't made in Heidelberg, it was made probably in, again, maybe around Regensburg, and it is on paper, and it has in um, a couple of places, some Hebrew writing in it. Um, and, um, and so that is suggestive for sure. That is the rest of the manuscript is entirely in tune with all the other surviving illuminated Velconique and that we have some of which have stories of the Virgin and Jesus. This example that I'm referring to does not, however. And so I think it's, it's by no means, um, it's entirely possible that these things were popular, again, among the top ranks, not only of Christians, but also of Jews, um, and that they may well have shared them. 
Um, so that's a great question. And, you know, and this gets us back to another program we did a year ago, of course, with Jewish studies was connected to the exhibition that was at the cloisters, um, a, a, a Jewish horde that was buried in the city of Colmar, which is in Alsace, so it's a bit farther west, but um, which again was um, helped us sort of get at uh, these were um, Jewish objects that were buried in a, the city, um, probably during, again, a time of clashes. Um, and um, but, but one of the things that came up in that exhibition was um, that one has to think about the day-to-day -day getting along. And this is connected, of course, Sarit, to your work too, that there are moments of violence and, ang and, and you know, deadly violence, but there are and sometimes those follow the certain parts of the, the calendar, the, that sort of acting out of hostility. And day to day, there's actually, there's, there, there are many more reasons to actually get along because it's simply mutually beneficial, not only socially, but also economically um, for Jews and Christians. Back to the issue of the representation of Jews in these um, manuscripts. There are, as I said, there were sections that, you know, and sort of, again, emphasize Moses's Jewishness in a way that seems to celebrate it. There's also Moses and his African wife, that is the um, material connected to thinking about an appreciation and curiosity about Jews as manifest in these manuscripts also opens the way for thinking about um, interest in um, in black Africans and Regensburg itself is the center of my inquiry there. And this was a city we know increasingly that um, Europe was not a homogeneously white um, space in the 13th century and that trade trading centers particularly were places where people engaged with one another and people engaged with people with a variety of skin tones and of, of ethnicities. So, uh, but back to the representation of Jews, there's also in the section that deals, my final chapter deals with stories of the life of Jesus and Mary, and it has accounts from Jesus's sort of youth and adolescence or kind of, I don't know, tween years. And he, there's a famous, you know, uh, sort of, again, legend where um, Jesus strikes down a Jew, he kills a Jewish man who um, tells him, because he, Jesus and his friends are playing on the Sabbath and the the, the older Jew says, you know, you shouldn't do that. And little Jesus says, mind your own, take care of, you know, your own practice, leave us alone. And he strikes the Jew down. And then Mary comes along and says, what happened here? And he revives the Jew for his mother. Um, and this is, I talk about this in relation to Nuremberg, where again, the population of the Jews was, uh, you know, the Jews were themselves, they're decimated in the 14th century, then moved to another place in the city and then revived again. So um, so that's part of that story too. And of course, I can't um, resist showing images um, whenever I can. And so that image of little Jesus and the Jew who he strikes down is in the um, at the, the right of the screen on the top one on the right here. Um, mm -hmm. You can see these words I put in because I realized that all of my chapters, each of my chapters could be cast in very modern terms, you know, God, power, descent, or, um, you know, class and race and um, labor and sex also all pertain. These are all, these are the themes I deal with in the book um, in its different parts. Um, just to jump in for a moment, um, I think one of the interesting bits, you mentioned the Heidelberg manuscript and of course the Jewish writing on it, um, which is, is typical because we know that in other manuscripts as well, sometimes, first of all, as you mentioned, and I think I, I'm, I agree with you completely, um, especially when it comes to the vernacular, uh, Latin less so, but in the vernacular, it's very clear that at a certain point in the 14th century, there is a larger number of Jews that can actually read the vernacular and, and unpack it. And the, the language comes across uh, in a way that they can appreciate the puns and the nuances and the story. Um, but I think on the other hand, the fact that we have um, Jewish writing in or Hebrew writing in these manuscripts may, may take us into other avenues or two other directions. One is, of course, converts, people who retain a sort of 
Jewish identity or Jewish knowledge of writing and who converted to Christianity. And these are their pastime manuscripts, but they still doodle on them in Hebrew, um, which is one way of, of addressing this. And the other is, of course, pawnbroking. And a lot of these manuscripts eventually wind up in homes of Jews as pawns. And part of the way we explain the way that Jews kind of absorb images from objects that are on the, you know, the table of art historians is that these objects circulated as capital and as served as collateral for loans and eventually wound up in Jewish treasure troves or boxes or chests. And at the end of the day, people started flipping through the folios and looking and admiring what they saw. Um, so this is a, another means by which some of these images kind of come across culturally through the religious divide, so to speak. That's great. I wish we had had this conversation before. I totally would have put that in. The, I mean, that would have been great. Um, um, can, can I jump in with, um, with fi some final questions and give yes. you the opportunity to, um, to also leave us um, with some final thoughts? Um, the, the, the questions that remain um, ask whether there are other marginal notes that you came across that are particularly juicy or interesting or give us a lens into other readers of these texts. Um, a second question about, um, you talked about engagement between Jews and Christians in these manuscripts. Um, what about religious or theological disputes and tension? Do we also get a sense of that from um, the manuscripts? Um, and finally, a bigger question about what do these books and maybe more generally also art and art history, um, what lens do they give us as historians or as sort of glancers into the past um, that other sources don't? Um, and, um, and sort of what, what does the visual um, material add to the story um, of this period? Great, those are all great questions. I don't know that I can do it in the four minutes that we have, but I will try. I mean, as far as marginal notes, I'm afraid that my answer there is kind of boring in that I have all, we, there are sort of cues to the illuminators and rubricators still that survive in, um, and particularly in the parchment, the manuscripts made on parchment, because that, that is sort of, sort of part of the process of production is that you would have instructions to um, the, uh, the, the makers that, you know, the, the text would be copied in first, and then you would have a note telling the illuminator what to put there, what picture to put there. And those typically would be scraped off because parchment is very forgiving and tough enough to do that. But in, um, but sometimes they, they weren't scraped off. So that's all, though, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there were juicy things to find. I just, I, I don't have anything right now to offer there, I'm afraid. As far as tension between Jews and Christians, that's also, that's of course a great, um, it, that's a sort of a key aspect. And certainly there are um, you know, the, the expected um, places like where you see Jesus striking down a Jew. I mean, there are, but you know what, you'd be surprised at, of how few, if, if a dominant theme that came across when I was looking through the 24 manuscripts that I looked at for this, if it was really hostile toward Jews, I would have written about it, but that wasn't there. Um, there was more a kind of curiosity and fascination, which is not to be, you know, naive about the actual antipathies and um, antagonisms, but it doesn't come across so much in these works. Um, and finally, though, the way books and art history can provide evidence, absolutely. I mean, what I hope that these works do and what I hope I do with my book is just sort of to begin to crack open a kind of brittle, um, particularly popular conception of the Middle Ages as one that is, you know, homogeneously pious, that there's this, oh, this kind of earnest and eager Christianity on the part of all lay people. And, you know, I want to bring, again, some sort of texture and vision to day-to-day -day life that allows for skepticism or distraction or, you know, daydreaming about 
you know, sex or whatever it is that again, that art history doesn't always have to be a, a story of um, sort of piety and royalty or um, the sort of, again, the, the, it, it's so limited in that way. And these, these offer uh, sort of a points of entree into those kinds of explorations, I think. So. Thank you so much. Um, Effie, did you want to say anything? Um, uh, I'll just, I'll please? just, um, my, my last comment is a one liner. I, I think one, one of the things that I take home from this book is that exa exactly as you said, um, if this is indicative of what is going on in the Christian world, I would say we can juxtapose this into the Jewish world as well. Because we're living in this environment. Um, Jews also had skeptics skepticism about their own beliefs. They had skepticism about the practice, about the way they live lives. And just like Christians come across in your book, I'm sure that these notions were present within the Jewish minority, although it's a minority, and although minorities think slightly differently than majority society. But nevertheless, um, this is something we should crack open and see and look into from the Jewish side as well. I really enjoyed this. Thank you very much. I it's been a thrill for me. I mean, really, you know, this is what you kind of dream of when you're sort of sitting by yourself, um, thinking these things through and trying to weave together something that um, might be coherent and also might be enjoyable. And so I hope, I mean, it's like, it's just reassuring to me that um, we're all here and, and, and there's stuff to talk about. And it's, um, and I'm so grateful, Effie, for your really insightful comments and your support and enthusiasm about this. Thank you very much. I, I enjoyed every second of it. Yeah. Um, and, and I just want to conclude by thanking both of you and thanking everyone for joining us and to say that um, we didn't get to all of the questions. There were so many other questions. And so I encourage everyone to read the book um, and also to be in touch with Nina with questions by email. Um, and also to say that it's a wonderful testament to your book and the subject of your book that um, we could sit here easily for another hour or two. And also that additional research questions have emerged even just from this conversation. Um, and so um, congratulations again. And um, Effie, we are looking forward to hearing more about your book um, in a few months time as well. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye. Take thank care. you everyone. Bye-bye.